Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, we are going to continue our discussion and conversation around silent data corruption. And now we'll focus a little bit more on the solution space. So continuing our discussion here, we're going to talk a little bit about who's the advocate for existing and potential solutions. You know, are you going to make chip vendors uh, implement these on their chips? Are you doing anything differently? on your own chips, you know, like the hyperscaler companies? The, obviously, the chip vendors have to do better architecturally and in the DFT methods and better detection methods. The challenge is that there's also degradation and aging issue. So mm -hmm. that forces a sort of in-situ screening model that also has to be there. So the workloads have to become resilient to these because mm -hmm. even let's say you screen these and before they come to the data center, they are all clean and you know, you're confident they're not defective. The degradation and aging issue forces you to also have an in-situ screening method. Mm -hmm. So building resiliency in our software systems and critical services and better screening methods and uh, being able to sweep the fleet uh, while it's uh, executing production workloads is going to be a continued uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there is a solution uh, that's restricted to just the chips or the software vendors or the data center providers and you know cloud service providers. I think you need the solution to span all of them. Not all software can be made resilient. Mm -hmm. If the chip is made more resilient, it helps all software. But because of degradation and aging, there's no choice but to also have an in-situ screening method and more resilient software to be built. Yeah, I mm -hmm. agree. I totally agree. Uh, it's a fallacy to think that this is a chip design or manufacturing problem alone. Uh, we, mo most of us in this space are familiar with the bathtub curve. Uh, at the beginning of life, usually in the first six years, to, or, sorry, six months to a year, uh, you have the front edge of that. You get early life failures or infant mortalities. Uh, and then as the part ages, then at the end of its life, uh, you start having aging effects. So the, the, there is no solution of just like pushing this back upstream to the, the chip vendors and say, no, you know, give us, give us perfect chips. Even if they give us perfect chips at t equals zero, we still are going to have to deal That's with right. this problem in the data center. No, whenever the issue of cost comes up, obviously my red flags all start to go up here, right? Yeah. Because I think there has to be an incentive structure for the chip vendors and the manufacturers to do better. The current incentive structure isn't aligned with that, right? We send them a defective part, they send us a replacement. Mm -hmm. That's practically no cost to them, right? Now, let's say the incentive was that, look, for each defective chip that we can show uh, and verify that it's indeed defective, you give us 50 times the cost back. Suddenly, the equation will change. You know, the vendors and manufacturers will start to do much better. Mm -hmm. I think the current model, you know, of incentive structure is not right and this claims that oh you know 500 dppm is what we promise and that's a joke right that's just not stood the test of time mm -hmm. right and the data shows that the defect rates are far higher mm -hmm. but the incentive structure has to be such that the vendors and the manufacturers also feel the pain mm -hmm. right and perhaps this kind of a method by where if the customer sort of brings up a defective part and can verify that look here is where it's sort of not behaving as uh, per spec, the cost to you is huge, then behavior will change. Mm -hmm. Right now, I don't believe that the incentive structure of the vendors not meeting their DPPM goals or you know, just sending us the replacement part, which might also be defective, is not working. I think this model, uh, this handshake of the contract is, I think, obsolete yeah. and needs to be revisited. So I'll talk about the other end of the pipeline, which is future products and future features. And, and there was, mm -hmm. your question was something about like you know who who's going to like uh, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but you know who's going to advocate for the features. And mm -hmm. you know, it's not really uh, easy for us as customers to prescribe a solution because even within the the chip design space, you've got architecture, you've got design, you've got manufacturing, you've got uh, post uh, silicon screening. Uh, infield testing, like all, all these features that span their whole stack. And so it's hard for us to prescribe what a solution is. Like we can talk about a DPM goal yeah. or we can talk about a fit rate, uh, but it's hard to prescribe features. But on the other hand, uh, 
we want to see those features in there. <laughs> like we, we want some kind of, I call this feature assurance. Like yeah. we want to know mm -hmm. that they're taking the problem seriously and they're putting in features. And you know, to use an analogy I, I like to use, you would never buy a car that didn't have any sensors in it. Like you couldn't tell what the coolant temperature was or the oil pressure, like that, that would just be crazy. Even though the car, car is no more likely to fail uh, than it you know, is with those, you, you want those to feel like, yeah, I, I'm gonna know if something is wrong. It's kind of the same thing. So, you know, I, I wanna see all of the features because if you screw up and you don't meet those targets that we're setting, we don't find out about it until like a year or two years after launch where we have volume and now we're seeing big problems and it's, it's kind of too late to do everything, anything right. at that point. Now, I'll draw uh, kind of an analogy to the functional safety domain. You know, having worked on, on uh, safety critical systems and automotive and avionics previously, um, I think what works well there is the compliance to the governing standards, which say, you know, here's the metrics that you need to meet to be at a certain safety integrity level, or let's say SLD or design assurance level A for avionics. Do you think something like that would be helpful, you know, for um, for RAS, you know, for to address SDC, and you know what's happening there in terms of the standardization space to to drive that? I think so, some kind of uh, like standardization of expectations is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Again, that's one of the things that I think we're going to address in in our OCP work stream. Um, but the the kinds of solutions that get used in that space. Maybe some of those translate over. Rob gave an example earlier of like you know, temporary lockstep. Like maybe mm -hmm. there's some opportunity there, but to expect that kind of redundancy at the cloud scale is just not practical. We can't triple the size of the cloud in order to make it redundant. That that's just bonkers. Uh, we can't even get enough capacity and power as it is. So <laughs> like, how are we going to uh, adopt that solution? Now you can adopt it at the application level for particular solutions, but what we're talking about here is more like raising the bar, like the status quo for the vast majority of computation that's not going to have a specialized uh, resilience solution. And that's what we need to address. And that makes everything better. The problem doesn't end at the point where it gets into our data center. The problem goes on for the lifetime of the parts. So we need the features to handle the part in operation. Mm -hmm. And that means you know, making those trade-offs and saying, okay, I'm going to commit to something like residue computation, or I'm going to commit to yeah. using a, a more advanced uh, ECC scheme, even though it's going to have cost, mm -hmm. but that's, you know, what it's going to take to address it. That's a great segue yeah. into the, the, the next topic, because yeah. I was going to talk about um, silicon lifecycle management, which is, you know, what I work on in, in my day job, focusing on monitoring data collection and analytics you know, at all phases of, of development, right? All the way from um, design to manufacturing, um, yield, infield. And so, you know, when we talk about uh, silent data corruption, uh, you know, what is that scope? Is that, is that covering time zero as well as the infield? You've got the early life failures. You, know, you have still some failures that happen in mature life, and then you have the end of life uh, effects. So we, we kind of think of them, at least that, that's the way that I think of them. Yeah. And you may do something differently when you're managing the life cycle in the data center. For example, you're doing additional screening and basically expecting more failures at the, at the ends of the bathtub curve, whereas in the middle, maybe you can, uh, you know, if the data is supporting it, you can uh, use a, a more, you know, uh, conservative regimen, so I guess that's the way I, I think of it. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, there's no, I think, easy answer, but what is clear is we need periodic screening mm -hmm. because of these degradation and aging issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't have enough data to say, okay, you know, is, should the model expect the bathtub kind of behavior? The other challenge is that we see other kinds of failures also sort of coming into the space, which makes it very hard to distill, you know, which is SDC, which is other kind of uh, issues. Mm -hmm. So looking at these things holistically is important. And, uh, you know, my, my, mm -hmm. my view is that, you know, cost is something engineers are very good at figuring out how to reduce. But I think first we need a solution. Mm -hmm. I think we are at the point where we constantly say cost is prohibitive and don't even attempt the solution. Okay. Right? The yield curve will be thrown or this, uh, cost issue, PPA, all that. My view is that you know, 
we have to take a bold step and say, okay, yeah, this will be expensive, but let's sort of invest in this, and then let's figure out how we make the, uh, the cost more practical. And in many creative ways, you know, dynamic lockstep is one. Residue arithmetic and sort of model of what arithmetic you want to do. Is it 4-bit, 7-bit, you know? Yeah. There are very <laughs> many sort of ways to figure out how to scale up and down uh, the cost. Right. If I suspect something has gone wrong, maybe I do a heavy heavy duty uh, enablement of these features. Yeah. Right. If I don't suspect and things are going smoothly, I reduce it. Right. If it's sort of coming to the point that you know I want to do a periodic screen, I can scale it up. So modes of operation are possible where you can sort of fine tune what the cost level you're going to tolerate based on the kind of problem you're facing. But that option should exist. The problem is without a solution in sight you know, the cost becomes a, sort of an academic exercise, right? Someone has to actually first implement these things, right? Yes. Implement full residue for integer and floating point. Protect all data paths, protect all memories. Every area of the chip has some protection, right? Enable lockstep, enable dynamic lockstep, dynamic lockstep saying, okay, I want dynamic lockstep only on this core. Mm -hmm. There are so many ways in which you can modulate the cost to manage what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But my worry is that the cost is one that brings up roadblocks to even starting on the solution. Right? I think once we have the solution, there are many creative engineers who figure out how to make the cost more digestible. Right? That's a great point. Um, I think I fully agree with you that uh, you know this needs to be addressed. Uh, we need to you know take on that burden. Uh, the question is who takes it on and who in the value chain should pay for it. Right, so some of the mitigations you mentioned were the hardware mitigations, but they can also be mitigations in software and the application layer, for example. So, you know, who should take on that? Right now, cost? we are paying the cost. Yeah. Right, so it's not like nobody's paying the cost. Right. <laughs> I think everyone has a role to play. The, the chip vendors, the tool vendors have to get far better at providing the tools to be able to find these things mm -hmm. or improve our methodology. I think the telemetry that has to go in the DFT methods, mm -hmm. the software, I think, Everyone has to share in this cost. Mm -hmm. And my worry is, you know, that the architects and those that are worried about PPA, and they should be, PPA is super important, are probably not exploring some of the options that could be made practical, mm -hmm. that may initially seem impractical. But first, let's get a solution. I often give the, the guidance that I, I'm afraid that chip designers are going to build what they think is a great sensor and probably fits well into all of their models. And then we, we've, we've seen, when you get things at scale, they don't always match what the models uh, yeah. indicate. Mm -hmm. And so I, I encourage strongly, make it tunable. Make it so that we can share data with you and you can refine that, That's you know, yeah. whatever you're measuring. Like, I think, yeah. Yeah. Our experience is that you know, oftentimes when vendors are not able to root cause, they'll say it's a marginality issue. It's actually a sort of a euphemism for we don't know what is going on, right? Mm -hmm. Because when we do our testing and we sort of screen at you know different voltage, frequency, temperature, and what have you, it we do not see any evidence that you know those are primar primarily the issues. Occasionally, what we see is let's say at low voltage, we can reproduce the failure faster, mm -hmm. but not that it finds new failures. Right? So it's that evidence is still not, I would say, engineering backed at this time. Right? So while we need to explore because we do not know, we don't have enough data samples, I think we need to think more holistically. The approach in the industry also with SLM, with the Silicon Lifecycle Management, is you know we have these monitors and sensors on the chip, there are eyes on the chip, and we're looking at outliers, right? So we're looking at detecting those outliers and taking the corrective action as needed. Uh, how do we determine that? You know, we are looking at uh, the Pareto of the the different fault types. You know, technology node by technology node, and looking at that, looking at how those faults would manifest in the field. What are the symptoms that they would exhibit? And then, and then uh, designing our sensors and and monitors to to look for those signatures. You know, whether it's timing delays or leakages. Uh, you know, how those manifest, and then using those to to detect the outliers and then that feedback loop needs to happen as you mentioned right so and we need to use that data to optimize our models and you know 
uh, use the measurements to, 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 to be able to uh, do that um, revision. So I think that's, that's currently the approach, you know, at least for the, the infield part, because we also see, uh, you know, there could be some escapes in, in, in the field there, like walking wounded parts, or there could be defects that are not present at time zero, but they start to, to, to grow and get symptomatic in the field. So, so those, uh, you know, that's where the SLM solution is, is being used to, to yeah. detect those and take corrective action as needed to extend the life of the part, you know, so that we can address SDC. So thoughts about that or, you know, any, any, um, any other suggestions from, from your, your side? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think we should try everything is my view, yeah. right? It's, it's like, it's not like we have figured it out and this is the best and right approach. Mm -hmm. So my view is we are at that stage where all ideas should be fully explored. Mm -hmm. And the promising ones will emerge that we sort of all align towards and then adopt, right? You know, certainly telemetry and sensors and you know, margins, all are active areas of, of uh, research. And then depending on what we learn, we'll have to figure out how to adapt. Um, I don't think we should be wedded to one option saying this is the right solution because no one has this figured out. Right, right. right. And so when you're in this phase, you should sort of explore as many options as possible and see which ones are the most promising. Yeah, no, I fully agree. And I also wanted to mention that I think, uh, you know, we talked about the whole community coming together. And I think one way to do that is through the standardization initiatives. You know, you mentioned OCP. There's also some work happening in IEEE, also some in ISO. So for example, IEEE, the 1856 standard on prognostics, where they talk about the part life cycle, the metrics. Uh, IEEE, um, there's a P2851 working group that I drive on standardization. Uh, and then there's uh, the ISO 26262 third edition that is going to include, uh, you know, uh, the, the TR9839 report on, on prognostics as well. So, so getting engaged in the standardization initiatives, uh, you know, are, are, you know, together with, with the, all of the stakeholders across the value chain and, you know, discussing this problem together and yeah. addressing this to address the solution. I think that certainly has merit my, my past experience with standardization, unfortunately, taint some of my thinking here. These things take forever yeah. and mm -hmm. tend to settle on the lowest common denominator. I just worry about, you know, that happening in this kind of space also, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think at least understanding the terminology, the measurement methods and being consistent there so everyone is has a deeper understanding of the problem and the scope of the problem is certainly very useful. Yeah. Um, yeah, we need to worry a little bit about the time it takes for standardization sure. and yeah. you know how it always sort of settles on the lowest common denominator is something we have to actively fight. It's it's a great point, yeah for sure. I think that has to be fast paced and we have to solve the problem in a reasonable time so it's and, still relevant. <laughs> yes. And even in the OCP space, if you look at what we're specifying and standardizing, it's it's kind of how do we communicate and how do we work together? It's not what the solutions are. Right. It's <laughs> how do we make progress and be able to share results and reproduce results and, and like have a kind of the know, framework for it's a, how to it's share a framework, data. right? Yeah, the framework and tools like that. That's kind of in, in metrics also. That that's yeah. kind of where the the action is, so that we can enable that exploration mm -hmm. uh, to to find the best solutions. Great discussion, and I think at this point we'll turn it over to to each of you for any concluding remarks you have on this topic and on also the previous panel that we had. Uh, so I'll start with you, Rama. Yeah, I, I believe this is a really hard problem that merits all hands on deck approach, right? I think uh, the goal of this panel also is to motivate everyone to get engaged, uh, especially the academic community to come up with creative ideas mm -hmm. for the vendors and the manufacturers to figure out what they can do better for the hyperscaler providers to become enablers in the end-to-end -end solutions and enable the community to have access to the kinds of systems that are needed or the logs for them to make progress. I think this is an industry-wide problem. It needs an industry-wide approach to solving it. And I hope you know everyone gets engaged. Maybe the whole panel is gone and we haven't talked about AI, so maybe I should do that. Uh, it, this is actually an interesting opportunity 
um, to use AI or machine learning to help us diagnose um, problematic parts. Um, one of the challenges, like we, we knew periodic screening, but you know, periodic screening isn't 100%, right? We're only as good as the tools. And even if I have a reproduction on something, I could take the same test and run it 10 times and five of them pass and five of them fail. Like, it's not as deterministic as you might think because the faults are not like basic stuck out kinds of faults. They're, you know, they require the moons to align in, in the, the right conditions. So you, you can still miss parts. And we end up with systems that were, you know, we don't have a screen that catches it, but we know something's wrong with it, like a lemon. Um, but there are some symptoms that we get as infrastructure providers, and if you can build a correlation between those symptoms, it's not going to tell you very definitively, like, this part is bad. But what it can tell you is that you have an elevated probability of yeah. failure, and so then you can start taking corrective action. You can increase the screening frequency, uh, your longer duration. You can use Rama's uh, dynamic loft step. <laughs> you know, you, you can do something to treat that part a little bit differently based on the predicted model. And I, I think that's a pretty interesting uh, space to explore, but it, it requires kind of more more data on which to do all the training. And you know, we we have tons and tons of data. So uh, at least so far, I, I feel like you know some curation is needed because the the signal is so light that you have to really uh, be intentional about what you're trying to train on. But I, I think that's a, an interesting angle, and maybe there's an opportunity for collaboration there. Great, yeah, no, all very great points. Thank you for that. Um, my view is that um, you know innovation always happens at the intersection of technologies, and so you know we look for opportunities to innovate. In this case, you know under the dependability umbrella between the intersection of reliability and functional safety, between reliability and cybersecurity, or other you know related technologies, and see how we can leverage best known methods from those uh, you know domains for you know so to solve our SDC problems. So. This was going to be an ongoing discussion, and you know we're going to continue the panel series. But thank you again to all of you for all the panelists for joining us, and thanks everyone as well for uh, for attending and joining. And we'll we'll see you again soon. Stay tuned. Bye. Yeah.